Good morning. Hello? Is it working? No? Is it working? Hello? Ah, it's okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this session on uh, mobilizing investments in the Zambezi River Basin. Um, thank you so much for making the effort to come up all these stairs. Um, <laughs> so I hope those of you who had breakfast are, are still okay. Um, we are still waiting for the um, direct, deputy director who was supposed to do the opening remarks, but um, in the interest of time, we're going to um, start with the um, second presentation and then when he comes in, we will then um, allow him to, to speak. So without further ado, I would like to invite um, Ms. Uh, Sonia Coppel from the Secretary of the Water Convention, who's going to do the keynote address on the role of regional investments to ensure the sustainable use of transboundary water. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much and good morning and thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Sonja Koppel, I'm the secretary of the Water Convention and globally, as you probably know, more than 60% of all fresh water resources are shared by two or more countries and 153 countries share transboundary waters worldwide. In the southern region this percentage is even higher and on the other hand, the Sadek region actually has a very good um, advanced transboundary water cooperation status. Um, according to the Sustainable Development Goal Indicator 6.5.2 um, on um, transboundary water cooperation, for which UNICE, my organization, and UNESCO are co custodian agencies, um, we, on the one hand, we had very positive replies in that 130, 129 countries out of the 153 sharing transboundary waters have submitted their replies in the last reporting exercise in 2020. On the other hand, the results show that we are really not on track uh, globally. Only 24 countries worldwide so far actually meet the SDG target and have all their transboundary surface and groundwaters covered by operational arrangements for water cooperation. So we absolutely need to accelerate progress in order to achieve um, the SDG target by 2030. But as I say, the Southern region is on a good track uh, in that two of the countries, for example, have actually 100% coverage, namely Botswana and Namibia. But also, as you can see in general, uh, the other countries are also quite in green. So the other countries also have rather high uh, values. <clears throat> Uh, as I already said yesterday, currently we are actually carrying out the third reporting cycle. So all 153 countries were uh, invited once again to share updated information on their transboundary waters by June this year in order to report this information to the Secretary General in New York. And I would just say that unfortunately some of the SAMCOM countries have not yet sent such replies. Uh, you can see them on the screen and we hope that they will send a reply also very soon. On the other hand, this, the questionnaire on this SDG indicator also asks about challenges in transboundary water cooperation. And clearly, uh, the majority of countries indicate that resource constraints are one of the main challenges uh, hindering their transboundary water cooperation progress. And those challenges are due to several facts. Firstly, the benefits of transboundary cooperation are often not well enough known, especially beyond the water people, in the finance sector, in the, in the foreign affairs circles, etc. Secondly, transboundary water uh, cooperation and basin development activities and projects are often perceived as risky in the finance community, for example. And uh, countries face also huge capacity constraints. Um, uh, so, um, hence the importance and usefulness of regional investments. And I believe we will hear some examples today. So such regional investments can really increase efficiency and effectiveness and actually allow cost savings. And there is a very interesting study from the Adaptation Fund published just last year, where the Adaptation Fund actually analyzes some of its regional projects from around the world, and they can really prove that such regional projects lead to concrete uh, cost savings. So I, I recommend you to have a look. Also, obviously, such regional investment can 
prevent unilateral measures and instead actually favor uh, measures which are beneficial for the whole basin or for several countries in the basin. And they have benefits beyond water, <laughs> uh, such as supporting regional integration, trust building, and peace. They also can enable benefits beyond water, for example, for agriculture, uh, energy, um, as probably most of you know. They also can, in border region, for example, they can really support and bring together communities, communities uh, across the river. And, uh, however, and basin organizations are a crucial, play a crucial role in this. Um, um, and so it's very good that ZAMCOM uh, exists and is uh, very active and, and is uh, developing this PDAQ, which will be discussed today. And there are examples from around the world uh, for such regional investments, um, some from Africa, but also from Europe. Um, for example, from Europe we have heard an example in the, in the Greater Geneva region where I'm coming from. There have been joint investment between Switzerland and France in wastewater treatment plants, uh, in modern wastewater treatment plants, uh, which have actually really greatly improved the water quality in Lake Geneva. Other examples of regional investments from the Africa continent are obviously from the Senegal River Basin, where the uh, uh, Senegal Basin Development Organization has regional investments, um, for example, in the Malantali Dam. Um, and here again, the OMVS plays a crucial role also through their regular budget to actually, uh, where, the cost, where the costs are shared equally between member countries. The Niger River Basin, as you may know, is one of the first, if not the first, um, uh, transboundary basin where actually Green Climate Fund has started a, 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 a transboundary project uh, through the African Development Bank um, um, with co-funding from many others. And the Volta Basin is one of these basins where the Adaptation Fund has uh, also a transboundary project along with Lake Victoria and, and some others. And another example which some of you may have heard of is uh, um, an innovative financing scheme which is currently under development in the Gambia Basin. Uh, it's actually called Blue Peace Bonds. Um, so this initiative led by SDC and UNCDF um, is aimed at blending public and private uh, financial instruments to support transboundary water cooperation and development in the Gambia Basin. So here, um, uh, currently, or has been already finalized now, a multi-sectoral and transboundary master plan.
Thank you. And when we finished, I was speaking about this example of the Gambia Basin Development Organization, where currently Blue Peace financing bonds are being developed um, with a goal that the Basin Organization itself can actually access the financial markets, the capital markets, uh, um, instead of each riparian country government. Uh, so this is quite interesting, and we will see next year if it actually works. But I think it's quite promising, and maybe afterwards uh, replicate it in other basins. Um, so the Water Convention, or Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Water Courses and International Lakes, um, is actually supporting countries and basins in uh, financing transboundary water cooperation through its program area, um, dedicated program area. And here we had already a number of global workshops. Um, for example, uh, one in 2018 at high level, one in virtual one in 2020, and we will have an upcoming one on 5 and 6 December in Geneva, to which I would already like to invite you. And then we have published also guidance documents or an overview publication actually explaining the different sources and modalities of financing and funding transboundary water cooperation and also organized a number of basin and country level workshops, <laughs> for example, in different parts of uh, Africa. And in the, that publication, you can exactly find such an overview of the different sources, their challenges, their ways of working. And I don't have time now to go into detail, but you can uh, find the uh, publication online. And I have maybe also one copy with me. So indeed, some key takeaways from these different tools are that it's crucial to have an uh, right enabling environment to mobilize investments. Uh, it's also very important to have sufficient domestic resources and member states, which should actually be the primary funding source for the core operation of the Basin organization. And that's also important to leverage other funds, like from, from international donors and from uh, also capital markets. Private funding and financing can be explored, and innovative financial instruments are under development. Uh, um, and exchange of experience is needed, and climate finance is now coming up. So to wrap off, just two words on the Water Convention. The Water Convention is now a, a global legal and intergovernmental framework for transboundary cooperation with more than 130 countries uh, taking part. Um, you can see on this map that there's a growing momentum with more and more countries joining the Water Convention. And now we have nine countries so far from the, from the Africa region, Chad, Senegal, Ghana, Guinea-Bissau, Togo, Cameroon, um, Nigeria, uh, the Gambia, and Namibia from the, from the SADC region. And several other countries, including from the SADC region, are in the process of accession, around 20, um, for example, now Zambia and Botswana. And we hope that the other, for example, some Zam, Zamcom countries will also soon join. One of the benefits of joining the Water Convention is really to, to, to benefit from all the, these different tools uh, which have been developed, to benefit from a global exchange of experience, uh, and also from projects on the ground, um, and capacity building activities at different levels. Um, you can see here some. We also have quite some different tools on climate change, on disaster risk reduction, flood management, uh, nexus, and many others. Uh, and um, finally, I would just like to thank Zamcom also for the, the good cooperation which we have already had. Um, uh, so, for example, Zamcom uh, took part in, in national workshops uh, which were organized at the request uh, of the countries, in, namely Namibia, last year. Um, <coughs> and also Botswana, no, sorry, not Botswana, so Botswana is upcoming. And uh, even in the next few months, um, we will have a number of other uh, workshops, for example, end of September in Botswana, um, Tanzania and also Zimbabwe are also in the accession process. Actually, Zimbabwe just sent an official letter of interest. And so um, we look forward to further cooperating with uh, Zamcom and the other RBOs uh, in the region. Uh, for example, with OCACOM, we worked on uh, benefits assessments, uh, and um, we also have a global network of basin working on climate change. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to further cooperation and best encouragement to Zamcom for the further work on this investment plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we've got a global overview, and now we're going to go straight into the Zambezi Basin. I'd like to invite um, the Executive Secretary for the Zambezi Watercourse Commission, uh, Mr. Felix Ngamalagosi, to give us an overview of the Zambezi Strategic Plan. Thank you.
Um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Felix Ngamlagosi. Um, I'll be presenting to you an overview of uh, our, um, uh, what Zambezi Basin is, but uh, focusing on mobilization investments uh, in, the, in the Zambezi. Uh, just a few things about uh, the features. Uh, Zambezi Watercourse or Zambezi River Basin is one of the largest, Africa's fourth largest uh, river basin after Nile, Congo, and Niger. Um, it's uh, in area wise, it's 1.37 million square kilometers and has 13 sub basins, population closer to 50 million. By 2025, we are, we are, we are projecting 51 uh, million. Uh, the, Zambezi Water Cause Commission, therefore, is a, a basin organization and was established in 2004 as an intergovernmental organization that brings together eight riparian states uh, that share the Zambezi Water Cause. As uh, you can see, the countries uh, that uh, uh, share the Zambezi, Angola, uh, Botswana, uh, Malawi, uh, Namibia, uh, Zambia, uh, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe, um, but also Mozambique. Uh, the reason or the objective of forming this institution, uh, ZAMCOM was formed to promote equitable and reasonable utilization of the water resources of the Zambezi, but also to promote efficient management and sustainable development that goes uh, with the resource. Uh, generally, the ZAMCOM has a vision which is very much aligned to the SADC vision, and that is uh, building a regional, the, the SADC region, uh, vision, which is uh, building uh, a, region, a region with a high degree of harmonization and rationalization, but also to enable pooling of resources to, to achieve collective self reliance. Um, but now the ZAMCOM vision, therefore, envisages a future which is characterized by equitable and sustainable utilization of the water resources, uh, but also regional integration and economic benefits, looking at the present uh, uh, generation, but also the future generation. This vision by ZAMCOM is drawn from uh, the regional aspirations, uh, uh, namely the uh, SADC uh, aspirations, but also uh, the uh, ZAMCOM agreements but also the implementation plan for the Zambezi River Basin, which was uh, prepared um, uh, uh, some years ago. So that cumulatively informs the vision that we have uh, at ZAMCOM. And implementing the strategic, uh, the, 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 the agreement, the ZAMCOM agreement, we had to now draw up a strategic plan. So ZAMCOM and riparian states developed a long-term strategic plan for the Zambezi. Uh, it's a 22-year uh, uh, strategic plan, and uh, it ends to 2040. It's a strategic plan 2040. 2040. And this plan is um, generally, it's a general planning tool. It presents a general planning tool and a process for identification, but also prioritization of projects and programs in the Zambezi for the efficient management and sustainable development of the basin uh, in general. Uh, this program or the strategic plan was developed through a very elaborate uh, stakeholder consultation, uh, which was uh, uh, conducted in all riparian states, but also at regional level and is already in a document that was approved by the Council of Ministers in 20, uh, 2019. Um, the strategic plan contains two major parts. The first part is uh, what are the, the it, it, was, it was an assessment, a capture and a summary of, or in, uh, of assessment of uh, the region. And this assessment has uh, come up with the uh, five key or regional issues. Uh, the first issue in the Zambezi is uh, poverty. There is high level of poverty and uh, 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 also, the, the second issue, uh, key issue, which is uh, strategic in the region is the infrastructure deficit. These are all infrastructure related to water supplies, irrigation, roads, health, 
uh, you know, uh, just to mention but a few. Um, there is also an issue, um, the third, third one is environmental degradation. That is also very evident, and the, the environmental degradation in the region. And also competing uses among the different countries, but also uh, between different and among different sectors uh, for the same, using the same resources. And uh, this brings in a challenge to balance development vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, issues of equity, but benefits for, uh, for, for all and uh, other trade-offs. And the last challenge which was uh, documented is uh, the disaster. We have disaster risk in the area. We face droughts in most cases, and we also face um, floods. And uh, in most of, the, most, of the, most of the times, especially recently. So these now key challenges were now to inform what to do in the coming um, years up to 2040. So it, the strategic plan now, second part, brings out now the key strategic pillars, the pillars which address the key challenges. The first one being infrastructure investment in hydropower generation, uh, agriculture, water supplies, and other uh, catchment and natural asset management issues. The second uh, pillar is livelihood, which is focusing on uh, addressing socioeconomic, but also environmental uh, and climatic challenge uh, to communities uh, so that the communities can adapt and respond or respond to uh, shocks. The third pillar is uh, environmental restoration, uh, sorry, environmental uh, resources protection and utilization. Uh, and also the fourth one, being a water resources management to ensure that water resources management and development is done uh, properly. Now, these are the four uh, key strategic pillars of the Zambezi water course and through the strategic plan. The developmental objectives, I would not read one and one, but one is uh, capital mobilization and investment finance is one of the objective. Uh, development and utilization of resources for equitable utilization, but also issues of ecological sound development, climate resilient infrastructure development, uh, public access to sufficient and uh, safe water supplies, but also regional cooperation and good uh, neighborhoods. The following this strategic plan, we have developed we are now developing programs for implementation of the strategic plan. These programs are five years uh, programs. The first one is uh, PIDAC Zambezi, uh, which is um, a program with uh, uh, an objective to build strong communities that are resilient to climate, climatic and economic shocks in the Zambezi watercourse uh, through promoting inclusive transformative investments, job creation and ecosystem-based solutions. The program has four components, um, and each has two subcomponents. Um, the major ones now, the, ma the first pro component is focusing on uh, integrated uh, landscape management approaches, but also integrated water resources management. The second um, uh, uh, component is focusing on climate uh, resilient infrastructure uh, development and also uh, reinforcing inclusive livelihood. The third component of the program is focusing on strengthening adaptive capacity of communities, but also issues of institutional uh, strengthening. And the fourth is uh, the monitoring and management of uh, the entire program. Um, this is uh, a program, PIDAC Zambezi, is a program which is packaged into two major components. The first component is focusing on uh, the countries, it's called national component, PIDAC Zambezi national component. This is uh, a component which identifies and packages projects at national level. So for each country out of the eight riparian states, there is a report for PIDAC Zambezi, a particular country. Um, and uh, each of the riparian states identifies, uh, implements, and coordinates its own investment program. But second is the regional component. Uh, this is for projects that are regional in nature. They go beyond one country. And ZAMCOM coordinates 
the identification of projects, but also implementation of those regional uh, projects. The second program that we are developing in the Zambezi is called the Zambezi Regional uh, Nature, People, and Climate Program. This is, uh, has be, is being developed now with support from uh, a climate investment fund. Uh, we are preparing a, a regional uh, program to pilot and scale up nature-based solutions in developing countries in the eight riparian states. Um, but this project will focus more in five uh, countries. Uh, the program aims to promote and protect nature, natural environments through landscape approaches by investing in agriculture, food production, forest, land use, and coastal uh, system management. ZAMCOM, with the support from our strategic partners, we are developing now. We have started the process of developing the investment plan for this program. Um, now, another thing which is important to note here is partnerships and cooperation. Uh, within the ZAMCOM. ZAMCOM needs partners in order to actualize the aspirations of the ZAMCOM agreement, but also the Zambezi, the aspirations and programs, the objectives, development pro objectives of the Zambezi uh, strategic plan. ZAMCOM is implementing uh, its stakeholder participation and uh, partnership strategy, where now we continuously engage uh, strategically continuously and strategically engage and harness synergies with other regional bodies, institutions within the ZAMCOM, within the Zambezi, NGOs, um, and uh, other institutions. But also we sign a broad MOUs with the like-minded institutions to strengthen partnerships and foster uh, sustainability. Partnerships allow for joint activities, but it allows also for coordination uh, co-organization of regional events, foster a sharing of resources, but also it uh, reduces duplication of efforts. We also, under partnership, we also have a role to support riparian states in mobilizing uh, resources for potential, from develop, potential development partners. Uh, ZAMCOM has uh, a number of strategic partners, including UNCCD, CREDIF, and Commonwealth Secretariat who are supporting ZAMCOM in um, matters related to uh, resource mobilization for implementation of our strategic plan. But we also work for now, uh, we have started engaging, we are working with the African Development Bank. They are working with us as the lead financier, supporting ZAMCOM in engaging other development partners to support implementation of the strategic plan. We recently, as I said, have already uh, 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 got uh, support from uh, the Climate Investment Fund. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as the Chinese proverb says, a tower is built when soil is on earth is accumulates, and uh, a river is formed when streams come together. Uh, let us come together to create that uh, the needed the resilient infrastructure and the investments in the Zambezi uh, water course. Thank you for your time and ob muito obrigado. Thank you very much, um, Felix. Um, so we've been informed that uh, we can overrun the session by 30 minutes. Um, so we will be able to um, wrap up uh, at 11. Um, however, um, also just again in the interest of time, we will, some of the presenters um, have had to leave um, for other commitments they have. So I hope you will bear with us as we try to be flexible in terms of the program. Um, so we will go ahead and now we will delve, dive uh, a bit deeper into the, the financing for, for the Zambezi. And I'm going to request um, uh, Mr. Yapi Sulungwe, who's online, who's the task manager for the um, PIDAC Zambezi program to uh, give us more information with regards to the projects that um, the Executive Secretary went through. Thank you. I'm working for ADB. I'm the task manager for BIDAC Zambezi. Um, um, I'm not in the office at the moment, so please, um, I just request that I should um, close the video because uh, 
it might affect my presentation. Is that okay, Catherine? Hello, Catherine? Yes, yeah, it's fine for you to... Um, yeah, the connection is not very stable on this side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can you see the slides? Is it sharing the screen? Yeah, I'm sharing my screen now. Can you just give us a second? We can't see the slides yet. Yeah, I think uh, they, they were... I'm not sure if it is only me. Um, I, well, I'm not able to see the full screen. Um, so just check if uh, the ones who are connected online are able to see the full screen. Okay, so Even the IT are side, checking. Is okay? Yeah, the IT are checking. Okay, can you see now? Can you see my screen? Not yet. It's about to come on. Okay, we can see your screen. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much um, once again, Catherine and colleagues. Um, I will just add on what um, the ES has indicated, but remaining focusing on PDAC Zambezi and the, as a bank, we are mainly interested in the availability of financial resources. So just uh, to highlight what uh, ES has indicated, this slide is similar to what uh, he showed, but my main emphasis is on the riparian states. Um, as a bank, we would wish all the eight Japanian states to participate in all the activities as far as PDAC Zambezi is concerned and also subsequent activities. Uh, so we have eight Japanian states. Um, of course, in our classification, these uh, Japanian states have got different categories. I'll cover that one when I'm presenting the financial plan. As the ES has indicated, uh, the strategic plan has got four pillars. So um, these four pillars are also the ones which uh, PDAX and Bezi uh, um, has, has focused on because we have to be in line with the requirements of uh, strategy, um, the strategic plan, including the requirements of, uh, of ZAMCOM. Um, of course, uh, one of the slides which uh, ES indicated has a figure of 28 billion. He didn't mention that one, but I want to emphasize on that one, because that is the requirement which is needed as far as the strategic plan is concerned. Of course, one of the two, one, one or two elements do not have estimates, but as at now, they are, they are requiring about 28 billion uh, for the next 20 years. Of course, uh, this uh, strategic plan started in 2018, so we are uh, slightly behind schedule. Uh, in terms of PDAC Zambezi, um, we've been working with Zamcom, but Zamcom has got uh, strategic partners, um, that's uh, Credif and UNCCD. Um, of course, there are also Commonwealth Secretariat participated at some point. Um, we acknowledge their participation, but within Zamcom, there are eight states which I highlighted earlier on. So these are all, um, participants in terms of PDAC Zambezi. We, we are supposed to um, work with uh, all the eight dependent states based on the ZSP pillars and also the report which was produced by Credit Fund UNCCD, which has highlighted the variability hotspots. These are the entry points for PDAC Zambezi. Um, as I indicated, the requirement is about 28 billion. So PDAC Zambezi should be taken as one of the uh, programs which are addressing that requirement for the ZSP. And this is a small element. You can notice that 20 billion is a lot of uh, money, but still um, ES highlighted issues on partnership and cooperation. So we hope that most of the players will come in so that uh, Zam Zamcom can fulfill its plans. Uh, going back to PDAC Zambezi, um, based on the reports which were produced by CREDIF and UNCCD, um, we have with, um, the total of about 498 million US um, UA, which is about six, 662 US, uh, million US dollars, which is required for the OH, uh, all the eight uh, repatriation states and also ZAMCOM as a regional organization. So for, for us to fulfill the requirements of Peter Zambezi, we need such type of uh, uh, resource. 
um, I will not go through this because um, ES has already indicated. This is the phase one of the uh, PDAG Zambezi, which is currently ongoing. It was approved uh, in December 20, 2022, uh, but it has only got um, um, Zambia and Mozambique uh, as national projects and also Zamcom as a regional project. So we have only three operations which we are currently implementing. Um, these three operations, um, the, the, in terms of resources, you notice that uh, Mozambique, uh, that's a column which has got uh, PDAX and BZ1. Mozambique uh, contributed about uh, 2.16, 2 Zambia 7.04, and then Zimbabwe, sorry, Zamcom about 3.5. As uh, the earlier speaker indicated, I think the first presentation, you know, when we are trying to mobilize resources, we request the participating countries to contribute seed money. Uh, the earlier speaker, the first speaker indicated that some of the countries uh, did not respond to their call or they were still waiting for them to participate in their activities. Similar with PIDAC Zambezi, when the call for proposal was opened, um, the request was submitted to all the repairing states, but uh, we only received um, responses from two um, countries, that's Mozambique and Zambia. Of course, uh, Zimbabwe submitted, but there were some issues and they, they were not able to, um, to participate in this first phase. So the original um, plan for the PIDAC Zambia's one was about 260 million. Um, you notice that from there, we might, we just ended up having a project with about uh, 16 million or so US dollars. Uh, we're leaving a financing gap, which is very huge. Of course, it's still work in progress, but uh, if you are looking at the financing gap, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so currently, um, the bank has opened a second call for proposal for the our regional operations in Europe. We are using this regional operations in Europe to leverage more resources um, from our sister window, which is the regional operations uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, so what is required on this is that uh, we are supposed to receive endorsement letters from the governments, as I earlier on indicated, and for ADF and brand countries. Uh, ADF are the countries which have not uh, added anything, but uh, for brand and ADF countries, um, these are the ones which are supposed to leverage uh, more resources from the regional operations in Europe because our in Europe falls under the category of ADF. ADF is uh, African Development Fund. Um, what's the, the last three countries? Those are the ADB countries, uh, which are categorized as uh, mid, middle income country. Those countries can only access resources from ADB, that's Angola, Namibia, and Botswana. They will not be able to leverage resources from from the ADF uh, 16 regional operations in Europe. So uh, this, uh, call for for, this call for proposal will close on the 20th of October. Um, as of now, we just received uh, uh, endorsement letters from Zimbabwe, Botswana, and uh, there was, uh, uh, we also received a letter from, from Mozambique from the sector ministry, but uh, the letter which we normally Use it's a one from uh, the ministry responsible for finance. In this case, Minister of Finance. Um, you can see that uh, the zone two, which is uh, supposed to be prepared this year, is a bit ambitious. We have um, um, we are targeting about uh, 296 uh, million US, which is about 394 million US dollars. Um, Apart from ADF resources and ADB resources, we also have uh, the window from CAW, that's a climate action window. This window has just been uh, inserted by the bank. Uh, that's a climate action window. We are hoping that we might get uh, 25 million from that window. And then from Jeff, uh, Jeff, we started the process sometime back. Um, uh, that and uh, the the beef which we we submitted was for the seven Jeff seven, but now it's eight. So we might have to revise some of the elements. We are hoping that we might get about ten point five. If uh, we reduce, maybe it can come to ten million uh, US dollars. Um, the ten million UA in our terms. Uh, for the 
for GCF, we also have a concept note, which is ready. It's about 100 million. So in terms of planning, maybe we will go get about 90. Um, for CIF, um, that's climate investment funds. Um, we already have uh, uh, clearance from CIF uh, for the regional projects. And also we have for the national project. For regional projects, uh, we have the five countries. Um, that's uh, Malawi, Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, Zambia, and the Namibia, um, and also Zamcom. So we have an envelope of about 64 million, but uh, this, um, the estimate which is here is just rough because uh, CIF has not uh, given us the actual indication of how much we are going to uh, give to each particular country and also the, the modalities. Um, so for CIF, now we, are, we also received a, a grant of about 500, uh, a grant of about uh, 500,000 uh, US dollars for preparation of the investment plan for the regional uh, project. We already did a scoping mission uh, for the regional project. The next one is to prepare the documents and then uh, uh, fill this, uh, the joint mission. But the resources might come later, maybe next year, in terms of uh, the actual investment. What is indicated here is just the investment plan. It does not include the the resources which have been reserved for, for preparing the investment plan. So if we include this uh, PDAC 2, um, it means that uh, we are going to have about 296. So if we take it back to that table, which we area on, on, I already on presented in terms of uh, the financing gap, you find that the gap has been reduced. But that's a sub assumption that uh, we are going to have more resources from the partners. We also have um, an, uh, an indication that we might get uh, resources from EU and USID, about 45 million UA. So that also is going to assist in terms of uh, reducing the, the financing gap. Um, so this is just a summary of uh, what we have at the moment, apart from the um, African Development Bank resources. Um, we have the CIF, we have uh, um, the GEF, and also the the GCF. But as uh, ES has indicated in terms of uh, mobilizing resources, we still have a lot of work to do. So it's a request to all the distinguished participants that uh, whatever you can have in terms of uh, um, contributing to the financing PDAC Zambezi, uh, please uh, get in touch with Zamcom. It's welcome. We will have to add it in terms of uh, uh, co financing or um, so that you can participate in this particular uh, important uh, program. Um, uh, Catherine, I think uh, for now, let me stop here and then uh, maybe I'll open it up for discussion later on. Thank you very much. I think at this point, before we bring in um, some experiences from other basins, I would like to find out if there are any questions um, to the ES and to the AFDB with regards to the presentation so far. Any? No? I can't see very clearly. Yeah. Okay. Everything was crystal clear? Okay. All right. So at this point, I think um, we've uh, understood the ambitions uh, of the Zambezi um, Commission from an overall strategic level and then looking at a very specific um, program that's uh, currently under development. And um, I think what we would like to now um, hear from um, other basins in terms of their experiences um, in resource mobilization. So I'd like to call upon um, um, engineer Sylvester Matemu, who's the executive director of the Now Basin Initiative. Um, we were also going to have some experiences from the Orange Senku Basin, but unfortunately Fortunately, the executive secretary had another commitment and um, has had to leave. Um, and then secondly, I would like to call upon Francisca Wende um, from PTB, um, who will speak to us about um, experiences in the Ganga Basin. If I could then request the two speakers to come up front. Thank you. I think you could be on either side. 
Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we will start um, in our on our own continent. Um, and um, engineer Matemu, I think the Nile Basin is known as um, one of the basins that's been able to organize itself in a way that allows it to respond better to investment planning. Could you share with the um, audience how um, the Nile Basin has uh, tried to respond to this issue on investment planning? Thank you. Okay. I think we can move. I can. Yes, we can. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Let me take this opportunity really to thank the um, ZAMCOM um, Secretariat for inviting me to share experience. I know um, some few months ago uh, we make a, we paid a visit visit to ZAMCOM, and we engaged. Um, going directly to your question, let me start by the following statement. Um, Zambezi has eight countries. Nile, we have 10. But the operational environment within Zambezi is smooth. This is what I can say. Is smooth. You do not have disputes, you do not. Um, and second, you have a um, legal framework which is adopted. Unlike Nile, we do not have legal framework. It, we are in the process. But we are 50, more than 55 years of cooperation. That's one point. That is underpins the issue of resource mobilization. Second, um, let's see what is what are the real concepts of resource mobilization. One that connects to what I have just said is the organizational management development. That is one concept that must be very clear and is practical. But the second is communicating the prospects. You need to communicate the prospects. And the three is the relationship building. That attract and strike confidence among strategic partners really to see, okay, this is the better place to invest. Now, let me come back to <laughs> experience of the Nile. Um, how, when we started officially 1999 as a Nile Basin Initiative, as a uh, transition organization, um, Coming to 2021 or 2020-21, we already mobilized the 6.5 billion US dollars for projects and other operational um, um, uh, costs. The relationship and all of these came out because of the goodwill of the countries despite of some places where they can agree to disagree. And for your information now, through that, what are the cornerstones of what we are doing? We have a strategy um, of um, 2017 to 2027, 20 10 years strategy. And that strategy we have implemented the first five cycle. And some of the pillars of Z ZSP resembles, mirrors exactly some which we have in a, in a Nile Basin. One, our strategy has six goals. Issues of water security, issues of food security, issues of environmental security, sustainability, of which you have touched upon it, 
the issues of climate change adaptation, of which you have talked about it, and transboundary water governance or transboundary water cooperation. And out of these, we have developed what we call resource mobilization action plan and also financing strategy. These are the real key documents that really support us in terms of uh, coming up with the proposals. But with all these kind of tools, they give us confidence to engage with the strategic partners because they know what we want. And when I say NBI, which means countries have adopted, has approved all of these documents, ready to engage with the strategic partners. Our strategic partners, very few among, among those, the least. World Bank is there, African Development, yeah, Development Bank, European Union, GIZ, uh, BMZ, GCF through UNDP and the others. We have been working together. And uh, in terms of uh, creating relationship and the confidence of what we are doing, then we have structured um, every year, uh, every after governance meeting we are having, or every year we have uh, our platform for engaging, the, we call it an aisle day, we have a, a, a strategic dialogue with the partners. Even here tomorrow, we are going to have a strategic dialogue with partners. What is the purpose of this is to report back. Is to report back. What do we have done? The value for money and all of those. But also in our, at the secretariat, we have three centers, offices. Nile Secretariat based in uh, Entebbe, but we have investment arms, one in Kigali, yeah, investing called Nile Equatorial Lake Subsidiary Action Program, and the one is Eastern Nile Technical Office, Regional Office. And these two are dealing with investments. And one of it, as a flagship investment, is the Rusumo Hydropower, which is uh, has taken some long, long, some 46 years up to now, but we are there. We are there. I think Sonja have indicated one of the issues that really show the, the partnership and resource mobilization as the value for money. That is the Rusumo, which will generate 80 megawatts within the basin. We have a potential of 34,000 megawatts, but what we have developed is only 20% we can just say 20% of still, we need more investment in that. And uh, we have also, in terms of capacity resource, the country contribution is very key. And I see the one member of our governance, Dr. Lugomera. Where are you, Dr. Lugomera? Is the chair of our governance, the technical advisory committee of the, of, and uh, that advice the council of minister. And um, we have the technical team, which is really solid. We have the, 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 the resource mobilization expert, yeah, that will help to, to move on this country contribution. But we are doing consultancies. Yeah, the wetland, we, UNEP have really given us consultancy that is part of generation. Loyalties, now we are having the Rusumo project which will generate we will get royalties from there. That is part of the resource mobilization. So there are a number of projects, strategic projects, that when we develop through our capacity, we do that. And every project that uh, we get funding, there are administrative fees that also uh, contribute because there are issues of using the facility at the, 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 our, our, our facility and, and, and they contribute. Some projects, 7% of the total funding goes for as administrative uh, contributing towards to leverage the country contribution. And through all of these projects and what we are doing, even it uh, encourages countries 
despite of their economic challenges, uh, to contribute. And the trend is doing very well in terms of country contribution now. It is very challenging from the situations, but also some of our countries, when their political stability are not, are not, you see, like uh, in Sudan now, there is war, and you cannot talk of country contribution. Where? How are you starting there? So, you know, this affects, but life has to go on. That's why I say the, the, the conducive environment that Zamkom is enjoying in the region under the SADC, actually this becomes a bite to, be, to catch up a very big fish in terms of investment. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, a challenge here for Zamcom and the SADC region, we've got the environment um, and a very good uh, uh, example here where we can learn from. So I think, um, I think again, the fact that there's already that exchange going on between Zamcom and um, the Nile Basin, I think, uh, provides a really good opportunity um, for learning. Um, at this point, I would like to call upon um, a more, another example from outside Africa, and we'd like to hear about the Ganges and how they're dealing with investment planning. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And also, I would like to thank uh, Felix and Zamcom for the opportunity to, to speak here today. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Ganga Basin. I'm only sharing my thoughts and insights as a development partner working in the Ganga Basin. Having said that, um, let me introduce you a little bit to the context of the Ganga Basin. It cannot match the extent of the Nile Basin, but it is part of a very vast basin together with the Brahmaputra. Um, accompanying um, about um, 2 million square kilometers. So that's about um, 337 million football fields, if that gives you a better idea uh, of the dimensions. Um, and in the entire basin, there are four nation states. Um, but it's also a transboundary basin on a different level. Because if we look at India, which is the major part of this basin, um, we also have federal states within India. And if you think about the sheer dimension mentions of India as a country or as a subcontinent, then you also have some kind of transboundary aspect even within one nation state, because the federal states within India have a very strong um, own legislation and very strong own authority. So we have the Ganga Basin. It's not just any river basin, because it has a very high religious significance for the people living in that basin. And it's actually one um, the most populated river basin in the world um, as far as uh, population size is concerned. And that comes with a lot of side effects. So we have heavy industrial pollution. We have heavy pollution from um, domestic and municipal sewage, but we also have the agricultural pollution. So. When, when the situation became really aggravated, um, a lot of international um, awareness was there, but and also a lot of national awareness. So we have a substantial financial input from the World Bank, who started with a 1 billion financing, mixed grant and uh, mixed technical assistance. And this has been uh, topped up by a further 400 million US dollars just a um, few years ago. But then we also have a matching contribution, but even a larger contribution from the Indian side. So in total, um, only for um, the work that the National Mission for Clean Ganga in India is doing, we have 4.5 million US dollars. So this is really a very stark example of local ownership and national investments in the rejuvenation of a river system. Um, and we have different kinds of investments that are being taken here. So we have a strong input into creating sewer system, in creating sewage treatment plants, in um, enforcing the embankments and cleaning up the riverbanks, and then also creating designated cremation sites, because this is also uh, one section of the, of the pollution problem that we're facing. But then we also have the monitoring uh, of the river quality and then the strengthening of the of the laboratories within this system to do this. Um, so this is um, this kind of investment, but we're also um, looking at livelihoods. And this was mentioned by many presentations today as well, because also you have to give the people a perspective, an opportunity to go about their daily lives, to finance their daily lives. So this is also going on. Um, and this is only uh, what the public sector is doing. 
um, and the public investment that's taking place, but also there are strong um, initiatives to attract private investment as well. And um, let me just give you one example uh, from the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is in the middle of the Ganga Basin and the most popular state in India, um, where there recently launched an, an investor summit that's going to take place also on a regular basis now. And so this has really also attracted foreign and private investment into the federal state of Uttar Pradesh. Um, and one uh, very interesting initiative that they started um, is um, an incentive to uh, really create short supply chains. So this is also something that we can think about in terms of um, sustainability and ecological footprint, not to have these very long global supply chains, but have short supply chains. And um, the idea is to have one district, one product, um, so that the entire value chain of this product takes place in one um, district within um, the federal state. So this is a very interesting initiative that one can look at. Um, and then we also have, in, I mean, the Ganga Basin is so vast that it's also very diverse. And we have the um, very industrial state of Uttar Pradesh, but we also have, for example, Uttarakhand, which is already um, in, the, in the lower sections of the Himalayas and has beautiful, beautiful landscapes. So they're really trying to attract ecotourism and um, trying to advertise this, um, this sustainable, sustainable tourism um, as a way to um, to find livelihoods and then um, another interesting um, tourism initiative that has recently taken off is the Varanasi River cruise so also making the river itself a tourist attraction and then of course Varanasi is also um, a very important religious site um, for for Hinduism so this also then adds to the emphasis so, but this is also something um, something one other basins can look into to look for significant sites and uh, use them to attract um, investments. And then um, these are just a couple of examples, but we really have to um, keep in mind also the diversity of a river basin when trying to attract investment, because different um, sections of the river basin will need different kinds of investments. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very um good examples um, that I guess we can also learn from. I'm going to put a few people on the spot here a bit so that um, we can get the conversation going. And um, I think uh, they can see where my eyes are directed. But Tate Pera, um, you have experience working at the SADC region. You were leading um, the SADC region in terms of establishing our transboundary basins. And now we've gotten into that place where we are now trying to uh, really um, um, accelerates the investments and you're now leading um, one of the key basins again and um, I think from your experience what would you would like to share um, especially hearing what uh, the gaps and challenges we're facing in terms of mobilizing financing um, for the Zambezi and some of the experiences we're hearing um, here so just I know I'm putting you on the spot but I think yeah Now it's working. Yeah. Now it's working. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I, I was just saying, uh, Catherine, it's 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 very good that um, colleagues have actually elaborated on some of the examples that are quite good. Our experience, obviously, from the the SADC level of things, has been obviously that it is very important to define that which you want to do and want investment in. And that definition should be a joint process by all stakeholders involved. But to zero in on our experiences, at least in Okakom, where I'm currently based, we uh, we have, uh, like like the, the two other basins, we do have... Like this. Can you check this? We do have this um, issue really around having developed our own program, a 20-year program, the SAP, through a process of TDA or transboundary diagnosis analysis, which identified all the issues that needs to be as addressed within the, the, the basin. And based on that, we have developed a program uh, that looks at what will be the quantum of investments that you require 
Uh, the program in its entirety, it's about 200 million that we would need. This was further elaborated into a multi-sector investment opportunity analysis that was done in the base. That identified that in order to really deal with the issues that were identified in the SAP, but also the basin being a uniquely high uh, ecological value basin, hosting a Ramsar site which then precludes some of the would-be developments such as a large hard infrastructure, not only because we don't even have some of those sites that you can do hydropower, but also to say we want to be able to conserve and preserve the, the, the ecosystem. Then we subsequently, as a way of trying to mobilize resources and invest and investment, attract investment, we have developed what we call the COB Fund, which is the Kubango Okavango River Basin Fund. The fund is looking at supporting resilient development. And this is a notion that we have to address those issues that makes the communities in the basin, as well as the countries that depend on this basin, resilient in terms of resources that they need. This uh, is hoping to invest, to, or rather to, to, to raise about 250 million US dollars. And when we're doing the, the um, value proposition, it was indicated that for every seven, one dollar invested, the benefits could accrue at a $7 ratio. And this is because of uh, the kind of things that are being targeted and the kind of investments that we are hoping to get. I was very interested when I heard from uh, the Nile Basin that among other things, they are able, I probably will explain this even further, you are able to uh, uh, get royalties from an infrastructure that is in the basin in a particular country that can be spread across, unless I misunderstood that. Because this is exactly one of the ways that we think have been very elusive. We talk about um, uh, payment for ecosystem services. In the COP, this is very important. But that scheme requires that the countries involved are willing, one, to collect those levies and then be able to coordinate them and make sure that some of those levies do and are plowed back into the system to ensure sustainability of the system in question. And I think if you are able to uh, secure resources uh, from operations of uh, a hydropower dam in the form of realities that can actually accrue to to the basin as a whole, then that is a very important development that I think we could learn a lot from. This is easier, we know, with OMVS because they are established to do that. But in some of our basins, some of those projects are sovereign uh, loans from countries and so resources coming out of those would not easily find their way into the bigger pool of things. But I think this is an important and interesting debate. So we, we are learning as, as it is because also OCACOM is trying to raise these resources to ensure that we sustain our, our systems and make sure that the benefits that we were talking about the other day that are accruing continue to be there and are even enhanced. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tate. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. So again, um, just to um, building on the, the, the presentation that was made by AFDB, and I'm wondering if Yapi is still online or one of the AFDB colleagues. But I think um, one of the, the key things I think um, that we would like to delve deeper into is what is the constraint? So we saw with zone one for Zambes, we only had um, two countries um, taking up. From your experiences, what would you say is required in order to, to, to get our, whether it's finance ministries or the sectoral ministries, to be able to, to really make the investment case for these uh, type of uh, basin projects? How can we get more countries, particularly in this particular basin, to be involved in, in, in Pirak Zambezi? So I don't know if uh, colleagues from the bank who are here um, can take a shot at this, and, or if you appear online, if he's still available. Is he? Yep, you're yes, you're Catherine, okay. I'm still, yes, um, I'm still connected. Um, uh, let me start with uh, the issue of uh, region organization. We work through the region organization, uh, that's ZAMCOM, 
as our colleague uh, from NBI, Nair Besson indicated, uh, it's important that uh, the regional organization um, discusses with uh, the Liberian states um, so that they can fully participate in this, uh, this program. Um, as a bank, um, we, can, we have country offices in some of the Liberian states, but in some we don't have. Um, we also have our ways of trying to discuss with um, the Liberian states, but if it comes from ZAMCOM, it carries more weight because this program is through the regional organization. Um, as as uh, maybe I didn't, uh, because it was not part of the presentation, in terms of our uh, categorization, as I indicated briefly, we have uh, three categories. That's uh, ADF countries, which are um, more or less, you can say, um, low-income countries, which receive concessional uh, loans and also grants. And then we have the blend countries, and then we have ADB countries, uh, which are which received from the ADB window, which is uh, non-concessional. For ADF uh, countries, normally they depend on the cycle. Now we have ADF 16 cycle. So um, if they already reserve resources, which can be used as seed money uh, for PDAX and Bezi, then they can, we can use uh, those particular resources to leverage more resources. Like in this case, I, I, I indicated about the regional operations in Europe, uh, which uh, will close in October. If they, uh, for example, like if they allocate to one US dollar, they will get one US dollar from the RO window, from the regional operations uh, in Europe. If they allocate a grant, they'll get a grant. If it is a loan, they'll get a loan. But uh, that's the issue which we are trying to struggle because uh, we are not receiving endorsement letters from the countries. Our we can only act if we receive endorsement letters from the countries. Uh, they, if we get uh, back to the PDAX and Basic One, uh, we did not receive a lot of uh, endorsement letters. That's why the amount uh, went down to 12.7 million UA, which is about 6 million US dollars. But now it's up to us as a bank and also Zamcom as a regional organization to, to discuss with uh, the Liberian states so that they, they should contribute seed money, which you can use to leverage more resources. Are you, in the one of the tables I indicated, uh, uh, CIF, um, JF, and GCF, you know, they, 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 their resources will also be released if we have the anchor project. In this case, we are using PDAC Zambezi as an anchor project. So if, uh, for, for example, PDAC Zambezi 2, we also get, uh, maybe only $2 million or $5 million as a, a program, it will also not uh, um, maybe um, encourage the other financiers to contribute more. But if we have more as seed money, then the GCF, GF, and also uh, the RO uh, window, they might give us more resources for PDAX and Zambezi. So I, my, my, my plea is that uh, Zamcom should uh, make sure that uh, they should touch base with uh, all the European states. We don't want to leave any country behind, as I indicated, because this is a basin-wide basin program. Yeah. So um, for Zamcom and um, ADB, this way, um, maybe I can propose that we should do joint work in terms of engaging the countries so that the zone two should be successful in terms of having more resources uh, um, as compared to the uh, initial phase of PIDAC Zambezi. So I, um, I gave an example of the earlier presentation, the first presentation. I think it's a general issue that uh, countries do not uh, uh, maybe participate in the activities. Um, so it's up to us to sensitize them. Um, of course, we've done a lot of sensitization but we still have to do more so that we can have a lot of uh, participation from our um, the Elpedia states. For ADB countries, some of the countries, um, they, they don't have enough headroom. They don't have uh, available resources, but still we can uh, look at uh, some of the ongoing projects or planned projects. If we can have some resources from those uh, projects, which can be pegged as, uh, as part of the regional uh, multinational program. Because uh, if, for example, like uh, we have Angola or Botswana or Namibia, and then they have uh, activities closer to the Zambezi uh, basin, 
then we can uh, maybe uh, discuss with the countries if they can uh, identify some resources which can be taken as seed money, which can, will be used uh, to leverage more resources from uh, from GF or GCF as I indicated earlier on. So maybe uh, in terms of sensitization, we have work to do. I know UNCCD and CREDEF have been assisting and the Commonwealth Secretariat, but still we need we should uh, continue engaging the countries so that they should all participate. As I indicated for zone two, uh, it's closing in October, but we only have two endorsement letters uh, from Zimbabwe uh, and from Botswana. And yet, um, after receiving uh, the endorsement letters, we are supposed to prepare a concept note and then we submit it for consideration uh, for internal review within the bank before we submit it to, uh, to, to the regional operations secretariat. October is not very far. We are already in August. So if we don't get by September, we'll be panicking. So um, uh, I, if uh, other members are, pres are present here from the previous this is the message to you. Please submit the endorsement letters. The endorsement letters are supposed to come from the Ministry of Finance because uh, as far as the ADB is concerned, that's uh, our entry point because our governor is in the Ministry of Finance. So um, if we have a letter from the sector ministry, then the sector ministry should submit uh, the request to, to the Minister of Finance together with the country report because the endorsement rate is supposed to be submitted to the bank and also Zamcom together with the country report. So those are supposed to be initiated by the sector ministry and then um, the uh, Minister of Finance will submit the documents to the bank and also Zamcom. Um, Catherine, let me stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yapi, for that very, very elaborate um, um, feedback. Um, before we wrap up, I'll ask um, the ES will come and wrap up, but I just want to ask um, our two um, discussions. Um, Engineer Matemu, you specifically um, talked about the successes in terms of these joint investments in the now. Do you have any final words in terms of um, any um, lessons learned, particularly with this specific challenge around getting you know countries to to, to commit, particularly working through a ministry like the Ministry of Finance that's responsible for these um, sort of investments. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Vera. This is really a very, very important question. In any cooperation, and when you are putting countries together that have a common interest on a resource, but their requirements are not the same, the cooperation become of a value when you can have evidence of the benefits. What are the benefits if I join, I pay country contribution, I do whatever, all the work like. In the Nile Basin, we come up, we faced that challenge, and we come up with a document called our Nile, our benefits mapping out every country and what, and, and in terms of figures, what do you have benefited? And when you calculate, for instance, when the country contribution, as it stands now, 311,111.11, uh, that is the formula for every country to contribute, that amount of money, some other countries from Minister of Finances, they question why we should 300,000 plus um, to, the, to the corporation. What are the benefits? So um, we came up with that, and I think it makes that country comfortable. And the Rusumo has become a very good evidence. But we, came, we, we go further by looking who are the key at the national level, ministries responsible for finance, ministries of foreign affairs in terms of diplomacy because you are, you are, you are, you are trading with the sovereignties to bring them on board to make sure that they understand. And we have, in the past, we have established a parliamentary forum for members of parliament from different parliaments to come. 
and learn exactly what is all that about. Despite we have structures at the national level through our governance, but uh, in October this year, every three years, we have what we call Nile Basin Development Forum. So it happens every three years, development partners, countries, everyone, academia, and all of those, they will, be, they will be there. So it will happen towards the last week of, this, of, the, of October this year. But to summarize, like other basins, in 2017, we had a forum of heads of state discussing issues of Nile. And when we went there, the question which we didn't have answer by that time was there is issue of livelihood, poverty, industrialization. You are talking of Africa Agenda 2063. All of these, do you know how much this water you are talking about here can support in terms of improving livelihood? in terms of uh, uh, um, moving forward the agenda of industrialization, we went back to our shells and we come up with what we call, we prepared basin-wide program that out of that now we are having basin investment plan. We have it now. That will answer how and what resources are required to implement, to address the six goals of the strategy. And as I'm talking now, we are implementing the second cycle of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of the strategy that will require a total of um, 434 million, but now we have a gap like 245 million US dollars. And this BIP, we call it, there's an investment plan um, was developed not by the countries of the Nile only, but it was or involved the wrecks that are within the basin, like East African community, like um, IGAD and others. It was fully participatory, even those beyond water. So. It is a, a plan that will be implemented to optimize the resources and not really to work in silos. And this will answer the, the question of the heads of state, which we are looking forward to have the second one, mm -hmm. to go there now and say, you gave us an assignment, and now we can attempt to respond. I thank stop you. There. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very uh, good example. Any last words um, from you from the um, Ganges experience? I can only also underline what, what the engineer said concerning um, really highlighting the benefits of water resources. Because, I mean, I don't have to tell you um, that water is essential for us to live, to thrive, for the environment to thrive. But if we look outside our uh, little comfortable water bubble, it's oft too often taken for granted. So really highlighting also to decision makers, to the public, um, that in fact water is not something we can take for granted, but something that we have to take care of, that's something we have to yeah, um, really take a stewardship over. Um, so really highlighting that and um, yeah, then creating um, or finding uh, strong allies and creating strong political ownership, because this is something that's really happening within uh, within the Ganga Basin in India. There's a strong public and political ownership, um, and this certainly helped to to raise all these funds for the Ganga rejuvenation and as really helping the cause along. Right. Thank you. So um, at this point, I'm going to request um, Felix, uh, the executive secretary, to come and uh, sum up. I think a lot of uh, rich uh, uh, information given here. Um, at Zamcom are here throughout the, the water week. So please also make sure you, you get in touch with them um, so that we can see how best to support them better. Please come up.
Uh, thank, thank you, Catherine, uh, Director of Ceremonies, and uh, thank you all that have contributed to this uh, session uh, this morning. Uh, experiences from the Nile Basin Initiative, the Ganga <clears throat> Basin, Okakom, thank you, my brother, for the experiences that you have shared. It would be very difficult for me to try and summarize or attempt to summarize the very key and important uh, contributions that have been made this morning um, on, uh, with respect to the subject of uh, resource mobilization. These are suggestions that are very vital to us as the Zambezi Water Course Commission. And uh, we also value so much, everyone has touched about uh, having a solid plan, a solid strategic plan, an investment plan uh, for use as a package for engaging development partners and other partners, but also uh, the need for partnerships. But that has to go with uh, you know, confidence creation uh, so that the partners, the development partners and other partners are comfortable working with the RBOs, including Zambezi Water Cause Commission. Thank you so much for that. Again, I'm saying in the interest of time, I just want to just say thank you so much for all these contributions. Um, and uh, we have taken note. We will continue engaging. And uh, every, anyone who is uh, uh, interested, there is a lot of space in the Zambezi water course. As I said, the population is close to 50 million. The issues are very well elaborated in our Zambezi strategic plan. We already have two programs, but we are willing and ready to even create more lines of programs for other pillars which have not been touched. Um, we are also a strong team. I, I have my colleague who is sitting behind, uh, be, uh, behind and uh, the others who are connected online. We are very much ready to engage uh, any partner that is willing to sit and uh, get more details about the Zambezi Water Cause Commission and the strategic plan. Uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Director of Ceremony. Okay. And then last but not least, um, we have the honor of having um, the Deputy Chair of the Zambezi Watercourse Commission Technical Committee, Dr. Elijah Ngurare. Uh, may I kindly come and ask you to make the closing remarks? Thank you. Thank you very much, Director of the Ceremony, for the proceedings, uh, for the floor to be able to make the closing remarks. Um, let me first of all just thank the experiences that have been shared from other basins, the Nile, Okakom, Orasekom was uh, also meant to be here in the Ganga Basin. Uh, thank you very much for that experience. We have learned and we are taking something home. Um, in Afrikaans, they call it patkos. So we are taking patkos home. Um, Dr. Felix Ngamlagosi, the Executive Secretary of ZAMCOM, development partners that are here, the Africa Development Bank, and others, ZAMCOM strategic partners, representatives of SADC Secretariat, delegates from Zambezi Riparian states, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. The Zambezi Water Course Commission would like to thank all of you for having taken part in this important session titled on mobilizing investments for the Zambezi water course. The useful input, the useful comments and suggestions that you have made, as I said, will become our part course. And part course just means what we'll take along in our suitcase. 
and suitcase to be able to act on and learn from. As you would have heard, the Zambezi Watercourse Commission Agreement came into force on 19 June 2011, and it provides for the preparation for the strategic development plan, including a general planning tool for the identification, categorization, and prioritization of projects and programs for the sustainable development and efficient management of the Zambezi watercourse. ZAMCOM has accordingly prepared the strategic plan for the Zambezi watercourse. As you have heard, the same for the Nile. Ours is 20, from 2018 to 2040, under which all activities of ZAMCOM and the ZAMCOM Secretariat fall and which incorporates all other programs and activities of the Commission. ZAMCOM, as you also must have heard, has prepared the strategic plan with the technical support of international experts and the financial support of the World Bank and the Danish International Development Assistance, DANIDA, through a process including national consultations within the member states of Zambezi Watercourse. The preparation of this strategic plan has been built upon and incorporates work previously undertaken by ZAMCOM and takes into account the national and sectoral plans of member states. As part of the implementation of the strategic plan, ZAMCOM, with the assistance of strategic partners, institutions such as CRIDF, AFDB, and UNCCD, has formulated the program for integrated development and adaptation to climate change in the Zambezi water course, or commonly and affectionately known as PIDAC, Zambezi, whose overall objective is to build strong communities that are resilient to climate and economic shocks, as you have heard from our executive secretary, that is done through promoting inclusive, transformative investments, job creation, and ecosystem-based solutions focus on the hotspots. It aims to increase climate smart resilience by addressing challenges impacting livelihoods and development in the Zambezi watercourse. The Zambezi watercourse has received financing from the Africa Development Fund, Bank, uh, ADF. They are here represented by my brother Felix, uh, no, no, Herbert Shinokoro and others uh, that are here. I think let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> to finance the regional ZAMCOM project of PIDAC Zambezi. The regional ZAMCOM project will be implemented over five year calendar, or five calendar years. The F AFB Africa Development Bank Board approved the finance of PEDAC Zambezi at its meeting of 8 December 2022 with the protocol of agreement between ZAMCOM and the bank, which was signed this year, 31st January 2023. PEDAC Zambezi was launched on April 26 in Kasane, Botswana. However, as the reason for us being here, we need more resources uh, because we have AFDB uh, on our side. We also need more on our side, hence the hosting of this session here at the World Water Week in Stockholm, uh, Sweden. Through a transformative approach which uh, ensures gender equality, youth participation and social inclusion, the PIDAC Zambezi's proposed specific objectives are one, to increase feasible climate resilient infrastructure that would support livelihoods, strengthen and build the capacity of the communities with a view to avoid, reduce and reverse land degradation and effectively manage water resources sustainably. I think these are issues that you have heard. They were enumerated and summarized by the previous speakers. It is um, envisaged that through this uh, set objectives, the Zambezi watercourse will have communities 
resilience to climate and economic shocks based on multi-sectoral climate resilient investments. Director of Proceedings, the key expected outcomes of PIDAC Zambezi by the end of five years, and by five years, all of us that look younger here will be able to see and live and, and witness it. They are climate resilient water infrastructure would be constructed, increased access to productive land and water resources, job creation, particularly for the youth and women. Uh, there was a speaker yesterday who spoke passionately about women, but we must also speak passionately about youth because there is no future that excludes youth. Once we do, uh, women would not be happy if, if youth are not going forward. Is that not so? I think women in the room agree. Please give us a round of applause. <laughs> and there will also be improved landscape through various management approaches, such as agroforestry. And finally, number of farmers with access to land for sustainable agricultural production. Our colleagues from the Ganga uh, Basin, you have said it, population-wise, you are the biggest, and it also means that food production is most visible there, and hence this uh, part of the lessons we can learn. Mobilizing resources for transboundary programs is crucial in achieving effective collaboration and shared goals across borders. These programs address challenges across national borders, such as environmental conservation, disaster management, public health, and the regional economic development. And uh, my brother, engineer Matemu, made it uh, very clear that uh, ZAMCOM, we are not doing too bad in so far as peace is concerned, and the calmness with which we are able to uh, achieve our programs. In other words, conflict is minimized. I think that's what he meant. We don't have that conflict. So ZAMCOM, yes, we came here, but let's give ourselves a round of applause so that Sweden also sees that ZAMCOM is at peace. <laughs> Transboundary programs, therefore, can enhance efficiency, coordination, and overall impact by pooling resources and expertise from multiple countries. Therefore, to effectively mobilized resources for transboundary programs, several key aspects must be considered. First, establishing solid partnership and fostering dialogue among participating countries is essential. This enables sharing of knowledge, and this knowledge includes indigenous knowledge and experience and best practices, significantly enhancing program outcomes. Second, aligning national policies and regulations across participating countries can facilitate resource mobilization. Of course, as we have said, resource mobilization domestically and resource mobilization uh, internationally by reducing barriers and promoting harmonization. This encourages a conducive environment that my brother, engineer Matemu, was referring to for transboundary programs and encourages international cooperation. Of course, when I keep picking on him, I should uh, disclose that he was my classmate in, uh, in Dundee, in Scotland. So that's why I'm, I'm picking up. He, of course, he's, yeah, he's younger than me. <laughs> uh, third, attracting financial resources from various stakeholders, including governments, international organizations, private sector entities, and philanthropic foundations is equally critical. This can be achieved through advocacy, targeted fundraising uh, efforts. We have learned from others' experiences and highlighting the importance of cross-border collaboration in addressing everyday challenges. Fourth, and finally, leveraging technology and the innovation can be vital in mobilizing resources. And again, technology cannot be without the inclusion of young people, especially skilled young people. Once again, thank you very much for your participation in this fruitful session, and we are mindful as WASCOM, that our presence here at the World Water Week is on behalf of millions of people who depend on the Zambezi water course for their livelihood. Thank you very much, Mwinto Brigado. Asante sana.
Yeah. Okay, so we've come to the end. Thank you so much for your patience and apologies for that uh, fire drill. Um, at the back of the room, um, there's some brochures that you can pick up um, on the basin with the contact details. And we will definitely be engaging in a number of bilaterals with some of the partners and uh, particularly financing partners that are interested. And I think um, everyone has seen the, the executive secretary who will be around for the whole week. Thank you.